Welcome. It's Friday night in San Francisco, so that means it's comics in the city. We're really excited to be here. <clears throat> My name is Matt Sillity. I chair the MFA in Comics program. Um, of our guests, other than the ones in the front here, of our new guests, how many is their first time here at CCA? Oh, you're not you. <laughs> so let's turn around and wave to our new guests and say welcome. Hey, thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> so tonight, I'm gonna explain this to our, our, our new guests here because I think tonight is always, to me, a very special night because it is the, for our students who are here over the summer, it is the exact halfway point of the summer session, which is exciting. Tonight, um, I'm, I'm also excited because we get to feature one of our amazing faculty members, our third year students, uh, know Joyce well. Um, some of you, this may be the first time you've seen Joyce, you say, oh wait, she's around here with her bicycle and looking cool. But <laughs> Joyce Rice is the, is the co-founder of Symbolia, which is this amazing tablet, comics, magazine, all kinds of amazing journalism and art. She's a recent fellow at American University, a talented cartoonist, an amazing faculty member teaching a digital comics course, and we'll be interviewing our special guest tonight. So I'm gonna turn things over to her with a nice round of applause. Aw, oh, thanks, Matt. Um, so thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Um, this is one of my uh, favorite lecture nights of the summer session because it's always so exciting to see all of the second year student work um, at the gallery opening afterwards and to see um, you know who my who my pals are going to be next year and um, I'm also I'm really excited to be hosting tonight um, and our guest speaker for this week is comics writer and artist Ted Nafee. <laughs> He's worked on a wide range of titles, including Gloom Cookie, How Loathsome, Courtney Crumnin, and the, a new project called Knight's Dominion. Um, so thank you for being here tonight. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so can you start by telling us a little about yourself and your work um, and sort of your background in comics? Um, myself, my work, and my background in comics. Uh, I've been doing comics since I was 19, uh, which was a long, long time ago, about, let's see, that would be 1990, right when the, image, the first image bubble started to expand. Um, and they were looking for literally anybody who knew which way the pencil like, made a mark could to, anyway. Um, and, you know, and so I was just a warm body that I could kind of draw and they slapped me onto a book and that, you know, and I had a bunch of lucky breaks and, you know, I've slogged my way through a career ever since. Um, ups and downs and I quit for a little while, but, you know, I tried to get out, but it pulled me back in. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, what do you want to know my, about oh, my work? Yeah. Um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about the, the work that you've done that you're... About. Well, um, I for I batted around doing create uh, or to doing work for hire for a long time, and I couldn't get anywhere with it. So I quit for a while and did video games, uh, and then the idea to do an independent, you know, little underground comic book called Gloom Cookie kind of popped up out of nowhere. A, a friend of mine who lived down the street was had written this little story, and I thought that would make a great comic book, and so we knocked it together, and it was just kind of. Uh, magnetic and we took it down to Comic-Con just we made a little zine took it down to Comic-Con handed it out we handed one to every publisher in the, in the biz just for fun we handed one to um, Crispin Glover um, who was you know just tooling around the, the convention and then we handed one to a company called Slave Labor Graphics who I probably should have taken a closer look at the name of this company but mm -hmm. you know you know a publisher is a publisher when you got nobody right uh, and they said, let's do a comic book about this. And within six months, it was like a big, big seller in, at Hot Topic <laughs> all over the country. Uh, they were our best customer. Wow. Um, I'm afraid I didn't um, bring any gloom cookie art uh, to put up because I was too lazy to get it out of the zip, zip files I'd put it in. Sorry. Um, you should, I'm sure you can find it online. Mired in time. Um, but after a while, I mean, I was drawing it and my friend was writing it. We were sharing credit and we were sharing, you know, sharing the profits. But I kind of started thinking, well, I can't really 
make a living doing this unless I'm writing and drawing myself so I get all the profits. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and of course, everybody knows that like when the artist thinks that they can write, it's usually not a good thing. So uh, the publisher quickly you know, read my proposal and said, yeah, no, no, this <laughs> sounds terrible. This, you know, this grump story, this grumpy little girl who, you know, just is casting spells to take vengeance on her schoolmates. That sounds terrible. He grumpily said to me, uh, said the most grumpy man in comics, by the way. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of slave labor graphics, but the publisher is, he's got a reputation. Anyway, so I, I took it over to Oni Press, and they immediately liked it. And that was Courtney Crumrin. I don't know if you have some Courtney Crumrin mm -hmm. for us to look at. It's somewhere in there. There it is. There was Courtney Crummer, and it was spooky uh, and grumpy and fun. And it was a children's book because nobody in comics, I, it was weird. I had gotten to, I was turned on by comics because they started making them for, you know, like a little more aged up. And, you know, like Watchmen was electrifying. But, but by the time I started doing it professionally, this would have been in 2001. Um, nobody was doing comics for kids anymore. Or at least it was not normal. Uh, so I thought I'd do comics for kids, and it took off like a rocket, and it's still very, very, you know, perennial seller. It's called Courtney Crumrin. It's about this grumpy, angry, uh, hostile, lonely little girl who uh, befriends this uh, old warlock who's this grumpy, angry, hostile <laughs> old man, and they kind of form this bond, this familial bond. Uh, and she in, in, incidentally learns uh, witchcraft and uses it to take vengeance on her bullying, uh, you know, fellow students and stuff like that. But yeah, spooky and dark. Did you always know that you wanted to write YA, or was this sort of just something that happened like at the time? I, you know, I was always. I didn't really analyze it much, but I was always kind of drawn to YA. I mean, I definitely don't look back that fondly on stuff that was good as a kid, but what isn't, like when you look at it now, it's not that great. Although, who, how can you tell? You know, I mean, there's definitely stuff I look back on and I go, wow, that was, that was awful, I liked this. <laughs> you know, Secret of Nim is a great example. Like you read, it still looks gorgeous, but it makes no sense. <laughs> um, but I kind of, even as a kid, I saw, watching it, I knew that. Um, and then Labyrinth, of course, is, Forever. Labyrinth is forever. That Everyone. one's aged well, yeah. I would argue. Weirdly, it has. <laughs> like, it's very 80s, and yet it also feels strangely timeless. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I I've always felt an affinity for, um, you know, all ages stuff. And like, when all ages movies come out, I, you know, I tend to catch them. And, you know, I tend to like all ages books, and I don't find that there's a strong difference between, um, you know, my appreciation of adult material, my appreciation of all, all ages material. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you, um, in the intro to, Cor to the Courtney Crumrin series in the first book, you talk about how kids experience fear differently than well, adults? I don't. Oh, uh, sorry, my I'm my sorry. introducer, that was my, uh, my girlfriend that I was mentioning to you at the time, oh, that, yeah, uh, yeah. who I named the book after. Her name is Kelly Crumrin. I met her, and a week later I was working on this comic book. I'm like, can I use your name? And she's like, why would you want to do that? It's, it, nobody knows how to pronounce it. And it turns out she was right. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, yeah, she, and, you know, we, by, that, by the time the, the intro came along, we had been dating a while, and, and she really loved help. You know, she kind of helped me develop it, you know, like never underestimate the importance of your partner, your, you know, life partner when you're developing a thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think I could have developed something like that without her. Um, and uh, she, so she wrote the intro and she gets onto that subject and does a really good job uh, exploring the idea of, you know, childhood fears and how they kind of form our personalities and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, do you find yourself, like, do you ever think anything is going to be too scary for your young adult books? Um, like, are there things you've cut because you were like, no, that's, that's too terrifying? I, you know, there's definitely stuff that, you know, I don't regret putting in. I don't want to think that I would second guess myself. I feel like it's important to push limits. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that it, like, for example, like there's this Courtney meets, like, on the first in her first book, she meets this little boy, and he's the you know, her own, her own, yeah. the only friendly little boy, and he, because he's really annoying, and nobody else wants to hang out with him, and and uh, he gets eaten by a goblin. And I thought seriously about showing him getting eaten by, 
eaten by the goblin, but then I thought that would just be stupid. Uh, one, it's too, it's too horrifying. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wanting, I was going for scary rather than horrifying. Scary mm -hmm. is you, you imply that it happened. Horrifying is you show it happening. Mm -hmm. um, and one is definitely has more, I think, you know, more substance and kind of, I like scary. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always, I'm more drawn to like scary stories than horrifying stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it sort of plays more on what's going on in the reader's mind. I definitely find that there's almost, I mean, you, kids like being scared. And they know when something is going to be too scary. They, you know, like I've had so many parents say, we got to this page, I don't know, like a certain page coming up, like that page, and, and this page in particular. And the kids say, okay, mama, we're not going to read this anymore. We're done. We're done for now. I think maybe when I'm older. You yeah. know, kids, they do that. They're really smart. They know their limits. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think that that's, you know, like the worst that could happen is like they can't sleep that night. And like, you know, that's good for kids. <laughs> builds character. Yeah, builds character. Um, yeah. Do you have any like kid advisors that you talk to? Oh, about that, your that young are adult stuff? that are kids? No, I'm just really talking to my own inner inner child. <laughs> you know, they keep me away from children. They read my work and they keep me away from children now. <laughs> do you you so you've made work um, in all ages spaces, but you've also made some like work that's for decidedly more mature readers and then yeah. like sort of just like stuff in between. Mm -hmm. Do you find that your process changes much when you are creating stories for different age sets? Well, story-wise, no. I mean, I definitely don't really draw a huge distinction between writing for children and writing for adults. It's just like for, for me, just writing for children just means, you know, the protagonist is generally a kid and, um, and I'm thinking in terms of like what's relevant to mm -hmm. this protagonist, uh, and that to me is I think that's enough for you know changing the subject matter, and also you know just a little bit like you know I try to keep the amount of I don't put as much dense dialogue on a page in for a, for a kid's book like I don't I don't want to have a giant massive hundred word word balloon every other page because mm -hmm. kids get like they don't want to read a hundred words in a single word balloon you know that's I I barely want to do that <laughs> I want the story to move. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I just, uh, I just, must, the process for the writing process is the same. The drawing process is different. Oh, really? Yeah. I How mean, does the drawing well, process Well, I mean, you can change? see here, you know, there's a massive difference. There's much more simplicity and, uh, you know, it's cartooniness for, for children's books. And, I, you know, I just, you know, like, I mean, with Courtney in particular, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but I kind of drew her as, like, mm -hmm. basically a big frowny face. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's just too, too two furrows and a, and a frown, that's all she is. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of uh, the fun of designing her, was, um, was really kind of paring down to this simple, iconic figure mm -hmm. that any kid could look at and go, that almost could be me, you know, because it's emotions first and like, you know, hair color, ethnicity, and everything else is kind of secondary to just this emotion mm -hmm. on legs, you know. Um, that being said, you know, I'm very well aware that, you know, like there's probably plenty of like little white girl stories around there and probably be nice to do other, something else next time. Um. Um, let's see, I've kind of gotten off of my, off of my track here. Sorry, um, I, oh I, no, I ramble, I apologize. That's great. Um, so uh, to change tracks a little bit, you've worked, um, you've independently published or you've published with small publishers, but you've yeah. also worked with big publishers like DC? Yes, yes. I've never really had much luck with them. I mean, I have a, I've gotten some work for hire, but I've never like made serious inroads into creating a reputation with that audience uh, or even with those, with those publishers. Mm -hmm. um, I got the work, I got the money, it kept me going at the time, but now I'm kind of really focusing on you know, I just prefer, you know, I can make a certain amount of money just doing my own stuff, pulling ideas out of my butt and just throwing them on the page and not having to run them by anybody and have them go, could, you, could it be more like this? Could it be more like mm -hmm. that? You know, that's, I'm, I don't want to do that. You know, I, 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 maybe I'm not that kind of creator. Maybe I'm not a good enough creator to really um, uh, sculpt an idea around the needs of a corporation or the needs of, you know, a bunch of other people that kind of want to, you know, wipe wipe it on their underarm so it smells a little more like them. Um, 
which I think, I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately, I feel like most media we see is a lot has a lot of that going on in it. You know, mm -hmm. you're like bopping along, enjoying your film, and then why the hell was that in there? Like that feels like almost a commercial for some other movie that isn't that I'm not watching, you know, or you know, whatever, you know, or you know, and I and definitely with comics, I mean, there's there's uh, there's a lot of like. I can't just sit down and write and draw a Batman comic that I want to write and draw, even mm -hmm. though I love Batman. Because, you know, there's a whole bunch of people who have, uh, who get their way more than I do, even if mm -hmm. it's I'm writing it and I'm drawing it. Mm -hmm. um, I can't use the characters I want to use. I can't go in the direction I want to go. I've been told that, you know, if I, want, if I have Batman smile, somebody will come along and say, Batman doesn't smile. You don't understand Batman, <laughs> you know. Like, it's my book. Can't he smile just for my book? You know, <laughs> he's not mine, you know? He belongs to this corporation, and that's, that's, you know, there's good money in that, but, like, there's a lot of creativity being stifled there. Mm -hmm. for, my, for my money, at least for me. For sure. I, you know, I get, I get like, like, you know, no, I'm gonna, he's going to smile. <laughs> this is a happy Batman comic. <laughs> oh, he's not smiling because he's happy. <laughs> he's smiling because you're frightened. <laughs> you know, like, anyway, sorry. I'm a fanboy, yeah. don't mind me. Um, so you've also collaborated with writers as well as working on um, stories that you have both written and drawn. Um, do, you, do you find, um, well, I what, didn't what's write your... This, by the way, just, just so you know, I didn't write <laughs> this bit. I, it wasn't oh. my, I didn't put all this in there. Anyway, I'm sorry, carry oh, on. Oh, no, totally. Um, so what's the, what's the difference kind of in your experience when you are collaborating with a writer, like on Gloom Cookie, versus working on something wholly independently? Um, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to put into words. It's uh, definitely, I don't mind working with other scripts, but there's definitely a, freedom that comes with working on my own that like it's just irreplaceable and I find that w when you're collaborate like I'm generally when I'm working with somebody else I'm very I try to be very polite and uh, I don't know if you like you know when I was a kid I used to be a big fan of this band called Bauhaus and oh. they hated each other and they broke up and then like 20 years later they got back together and they made an album and you listen to the album, you realize that these are people that are careful not to piss each other off. Nobody's saying, yeah, that sucks. Mm -hmm. And so you have this album of people, n of nobody saying, yeah, this, this is, you know. And so it's like it's a bunch of compromises. Mm -hmm. It's not actually, I'm sure everybody's probably has a, you know, has seen a piece of art like this where it's a collaborative effort, but nobody is saying no to anybody. And mm -hmm. that's a problem because uh, there's, there's a lot of decisions made that probably shouldn't have been made and a lot of, things that should have just been take, you know, edited off. And, um, and I feel like a lot of my technique of, inner, of um, uh, working together with artists is kind of just, you wrote it, I'm just gonna draw it, and I'm gonna do my best, but boy, I wouldn't have done it like this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe because I'm, I, you know, like I really have this very clear, you know, intent idea of what I wanna say with my work. What I found, um, after years of drawing other people's scripts um, is that I fell in love with drawing comics with comic book art because I like telling stories mm -hmm. with art. Um, and uh, more so, I mean, I would, I'd be a half-assed illustrator at best because I'm, I really want to tell the story. I don't want to just have a picture that's just a nice picture. I want there to be a story behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and so interacting with other art, with other writers is kind of tough to just go, okay, you know, to not just bite my tongue and say, you know what, you, you really want to tell it like that? Maybe you should change this line too, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, and, you know, some of the best comics in the world have been done where the writer does the writing and the artist does the art and that's that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it makes me feel a little stifled and I feel like I don't, my best self doesn't come through in that art. Mm -hmm. um, as for writing comics that other people draw, I have the exact op the exact same problem where I'm like, you know, I'm really, I'm, I have it in my head. I know very clearly, like with Polly and the Pirates, I, the sequel was drawn by Robbie Rodriguez, who is wildly, insanely famous now for having drawn Spider-Gwen. And all I can think when I look through it is, ooh, I wouldn't have done it like that. 
and like there's a, I, ne I don't look at all the stuff that he clearly does better than me. I just look at all the stuff that I would have done differently. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not him, it is me. I'm the problem. <laughs> but it's, it's a little hard to work with other creators. The, the, I find the, uh, the uh, um, collaborative process is tough. Mm -hmm. Co-writing is fun. Interesting. What's different for you about co-writing versus um, versus uh, working as a writer and an artist? Well, I co-wrote a book called How Loathsome mm -hmm. with uh, Tristan Crane, mm -hmm. and um, what we found was when we were when we both basically had a say, an equal say, mm -hmm. and so I would write stories and he'd edit them, and then he'd write stories and I'd edit them, and uh, after a while, you really couldn't quite tell who wrote what, but I found that when we had a point of contention. I hate. I uh, he didn't like something I put, uh, and just kept cutting it out and putting what he wanted. And I hated what he did. We were just okay. What are we? What are we gonna do? We you know we're butting heads and butting heads and we're yelling and we're you know. And then we come up with an idea that we both like better than either of the original two ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of how how Loathsome came about. And so it it kind of it was a great formative writing experience for me, for sure. Yeah, totally. And, uh, and I think, I guess, for him, too. Mm -hmm. um, How Loathsome and Gloom Cookie were both sort of, um, they, were these both in the, in the 90s? Um, was Gloom Loathsome Cookie was later? 98. How Loathsome was, I think, 2001. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so like these were both books that were um, like about a specific subculture that really didn't get a lot of um, like I don't oh, yeah. feel like yeah. goth culture got like a good nobody like really investigated the community mm -hmm. of like the goth community. Yeah, they wanted the uh, they wanted the trappings, they wanted the style, the the you know the the makeup. Mm -hmm. But they you know it's like you know just because like Lisbeth Lysander or whatever his name is, Salander. I, I don't know that. One. Uh, just because she has a leather jacket and black hair doesn't really make it a gothy. Mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. you know I remember watching like the American version of um, girl with the dragon tattoo oh right right and um, show them showing her in this goth club and or some in industrial club in Sweden or wherever and um, and and it was designed to show her isolation that she goes to this industrial with this hostile music and whatnot and then at the end of that movie the character you know is yearning to kind of connect with the really boring journalist dude, you know. I don't care if he was played by what's his face. He was, he was a boring character. Can't, yeah, Daniel Craig, he was, I mean, I mean, gorgeous, don't get me wrong, but, you know, boring. <laughs> um, and, and all I could think of was like, you know, in my experience, like the goth community is community. Like there, mm -hmm. are, friend, like, there are really intense friendships in that world. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a community, it's like, uh, and so she probably, it, the, the, a real person like her would probably have closer bonds with her friends than mm -hmm. he has with his. Mm -hmm. You know, she's there, you know, we're not looking at goth people and like, you know, people that belong to subcultures like seriously intense community subcultures are not looking at normal people and thinking, oh, I wish I have <laughs> what they had. We have way better than what they have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, anyway. So uh, when you were like first starting to publish these books, did you get pushback from publishers being like, no, people don't want to hear like these stories? Or were people like excited? And then what was the reaction from the community? Well, um, with the goth community, the community obviously embraced Gloom Cookie like crazy. Yeah, totally. Uh, but the publisher had, I mean, he knew that he had gold with, with it because he had already had this huge success with Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, that really, I mean, he was desperate for more, you know, gothy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, he had a slot to slip it right into. There were, you know, Hot Topic was selling comic books out of their mall shops and, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, there was this whole community that was starving for that stuff. And it's probably still out there and it's, it's probably still starving. You know, I'm just too lazy to go back to it. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a, there was a, a slot to, um, to slide that book into. With How Loathsome, it was a lot different. I proposed that book to the publisher and he did this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 
Um, so I went to uh, NBM, who was very used to publishing like all kinds of like erotica and you know of all of different mm -hmm. variations and all kinds of material, and so they were perfectly happy to to do a, a book like this. They saw it as a prestige project, mm -hmm. um, which I guess it was for them. Mm -hmm. uh, here's Nixon. Thank you. You're so on top of this. <laughs> Um, so you're a full-time cartoonist. More or less, yeah. Well, comic book artist, it's, I mean, it's right, different. Right. I mean, we were, you were talking about web comics mm -hmm. and digital comics, and like, I don't have it in me to do web comics. Like, I feel like that page a day thing where each page has to really stand alone and just knock it out of the park and be funny or interesting or engaging by itself, I can't do that. I, I need like several pages to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm always just blown away by the ability to just keep that up. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, it's definitely a different business model. Totally different for business sure. model. <laughs> and a very different art form. Very oh, different. Yeah, like an sure. art form that's way beyond me. I was actually I was reading Judd Winnick's strip art when he, because Judd Winnick went straight to doing strip art from, from the real world. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the real world and Judd, Judd Winnick and, and all that stuff, but he got a job doing strip art and he did. You know, you could really see him struggling to be funny every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and sometimes he was totally on it, and sometimes like, yeah, it's that's not actually funny. That's mm -hmm. kind of crap. <laughs> um, can you speak a little bit about like the business side of your work? Like, how did you, um, how did you like get your career to like a sustainable place? Um, God, I don't know. Luck, a lot of luck. Um, Doing Gloom Cookie right at the time that, because I mean, I wasn't, I failed at comics uh, and then went into games and got some work there. But Gloom Cookie drew me back in and doing that book right at that time, I was like, there was a niche, I filled it. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, and like in a way that, you know, because at the time it not only was there a desire for those books, but the people doing them either didn't understand the scene at all Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, and the, uh, the aesthetic, really, mm -hmm. um, or it just sucked, you know, <laughs> weren't very good storytellers, weren't very good artists. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, uh, Serena understood the scene, and I was a pretty good artist, so we had, we were kind of a double threat, and we really made that book work. Mm -hmm. um, even though, and it also had a very zine quality, we were kind of, I was lettering it myself using Comic Sans Serif, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I'm a little ashamed of myself, but that, that's what happened. Time. Yeah, it was, it was a different time. time. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate your understanding. <laughs> I would never do it today. I almost kind of want to slap my younger self over that one. Um, everybody wants to slap their younger <laughs> self, probably. Yeah. Um, so, do you, how many, like, how many projects do you kind of have on your plate right now? So you're working on heroines. Currently, I'm working on two projects, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, heroines and Knight's Dominion. Mm -hmm. uh, I got it into my head that this really started because I, you know, when you're drawing all day, every day, um, you need quick, disposable, easy to digest television or books mm -hmm. or whatever to keep you going. So I've listened to every goddamn Terry Pratchett book at least twice. <laughs> uh, I've listened to every Harry Potter book at least three times. Like the first one's more like 10 or 15 times. Mm -hmm. like, God, I'm so sick of that world. Um, I mean, I love it. But I'm sick of it. But um, and and I've watched uh, the um, the Justice League cartoon like a dozen times, and Young Justice like a half a dozen times, and they're brilliant. I don't know if you're into that. If that's not your cup of tea, I totally understand. But it's awesome. <laughs> and I got this idea in my head as I'm working on you know Princess Ugg mm -hmm. uh, that I wanted to do superheroes. And mm -hmm. it just kind of, the seed was planted and it kind of grew like a cancer. And, you know, and I just became possessed of this idea that I wanted to do a book. One, I wanted to do a book about all, an all-girl superhero team. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to do a book about where it was a team of, like a, a typical all-male superhero team except for one woman, but she was the main character. And the whole experience from her perspective is very, very different mm -hmm. from theirs. You know, like if you think about that, anytime you look at like a team of superheroes, like the Avengers, the one female character 
who's not really a superhero. She's an antihero. She's like window dressing. Uh, well, but she's but her perspective. If you watch that story, if you looked at that story from her perspective, it's a very different story. Mm -hmm. Her relationship with the world she's saving is very different. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's the same with uh, you know, like if you watched Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm just using these as typical touch marks as, that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, these, you know, again, you've got an anti-hero whose perspective on the world or the universe she's trying to save is very different from, all th from these happy-go-lucky douche bros, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to do that kind of story. Mm -hmm. And then I had this idea I wanted to do a fantasy superhero story, so I made the story about the one woman among a team of men, I made that the fantasy superhero story, and that was mm -hmm. a lot of fun, and that became Knight's Dominion, uh, which is... Um, Basically, it's about a thief, an assassin, a magic user, and a cleric all walk into a bar, and um, they, you know, and they meet this bard who's got a plan to, you know, break into a dungeon, steal treasure, and it goes from there. And it, by the end of it, it becomes the Avengers. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it's all told from the perspective of this character who's very much like kind of she's kind of a Catwoman character who's very uh, much an antihero who has no investment in saving the city or the world. Um, doesn't really, you know, the world, as far as she's concerned, can go screw itself because it's screwed her so many times and everybody she cares about and basically everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she lives in this, um, you know, very feudalistic, you know, uh, world where, you know, the, you know, the very, very vanishingly, the, the ruling class basically just crap on everybody else all the time. You know, very much like our world. Just like real life. Um, <laughs> You know, totally unlike, you know, it's like, it's basically, it's like the Avengers meets Game of Thrones, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, and so her perspective in trying to save the world is very different from, from you know, say, Captain America or somebody like that, mm -hmm. who is like, don't you want justice? Like, for who? You know, like, you, you know, I ne we never see, you know, justice, the only time, the only time people like me get to see justice is when we steal it. Mm -hmm. You know, which is what we, you know, which is what we call vigilantism, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in Batman's world, Catwoman has to, you know, has to get a minimum wage job and can't pay rent. Mm -hmm. So, and that's kind of her, that's the perspective. I, this is what I love about superheroes, though, is that they have, they give us this opportunity to explore morals mm -hmm. in modern society. They are, you know, they kind of arguably can be depicted as fighting for the soul of civilization. Which is why when, you know, this character wins because he's just stronger, it always rings hollow. It's like, well, that's cool. He was just tougher than the bad guy, you know. Uh, and the moral is usually, you know, being right means you're stronger. Which, you know, is another way of saying might makes right. Mm -hmm. You know, which, you know, that, yeah. And I, I love poking holes in that little scenario. Yeah, like, good thing the guy who is the best is on our side. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, lucky us. Um, but, uh, and that's what I like about those stories. I mean, the people seem to like them, mm -hmm. you know, they tend to be very mainstream and, but they're, they're this great mainstream premise that you can very subtly, um, subvert mm -hmm. if you, but, you know, of course, when you start doing superhero stuff uh, and you're not the mainstream, you know, uh, if you're not working for the mainstream companies dealing with characters that belong to huge corporations, people definitely second guess what you're doing. Yeah, so what was it like shopping around your, like a superhero story that was not gonna be published by like yeah. one of these big, <laughs> like the big four? Well, um, Oni flatly refused to do heroines. Really? Yeah, it's just they're my guys, I love them, they love me, mm -hmm. they'd do anything for me, but they're not gonna do a superhero book because they, had just done a big drive, a big, and they'll do this again, by the way, guys, if you're interested. Oni is looking for new material all the time for, you know, uh, young creators that have never, you know, that are ready to break out. But their rule is no capes, no tights. Interesting. Um, you know, they're trying to distinguish themselves from Image and from, you know, certainly from Marvel and DC and even from, you know, Vertigo. They want to be their own kind of pop culture flavored uh, publisher that is mainstream but not in the way that comic books are typically seen as mainstream. Mm -hmm. They're mainstream but not mainstream comics. And so they flatly refuse to do heroines because heroines is very straightforward. It's a, it's a, it's a superhero book mm -hmm. but it's also a satire of a superhero book. 
and that, but that's not good enough. They just kind of wanted to stay the hell away from it. Mm -hmm. So I went to a different publisher. And then I gave them Knight's Dominion, which doesn't look like a superhero book, but it really is. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you decide to go with, it's Space Goat, right? That's publishing. I knew this guy who was a, uh, he, I knew a guy who was a publisher at Dark Horse. Uh, he had, be, or he had been a publisher at Dark Horse. He quit, he wanted to be a freelance publisher. Now he's working for some publishing company in Berlin. Uh, but he introduced me to the uh, Space Goat guys and they, they had money, they had a, uh, they had, they were looking for material. Mm -hmm. They were looking to expand and go main, go more mainstream. So I thought, you know, we're kind of, but also in mainstream in a different way. And they looked at heroines and they're like, this, yeah. They knew my work and they they really liked heroines. They got the they got that it's it's a superhero book and also a satire of superhero books. Mm -hmm. That was that worked out. Mm -hmm. But you know, they're a brand new company, so they made some you know they made some bush league blunders here and there. In general, or while you were working with uh, them? Just with the book, yeah. you know. Oh, like, for it. example, they put out the digital version of the book well ahead of the oh, print version, bummer. which was not a smart, I don't, yeah, that, I don't know why they decided to do that. And mm -hmm. on retrospect, I realized that that was a mistake. And it really hurt the initial sales of the first issue. And boy, if you hurt the initial sales of the first issue, you're screwed. Because uh -huh. then the second issue is always goes less, and then the third goes less, and then it just kind of goes like that. Interesting. So they did that, and then they also wanted, to, because the first two issues really worked better as a single book, they wanted to sell that as a single book. So the first book is 44 pages as opposed to 22, and it's $6. And having a $6 price point for a new unknown book was tough for the retailers. Mm -hmm. You know, a $3 or even a $2 price point would have been much pref prefer preferable to a $6. Mm -hmm. It actually would have been smarter to have number one be $2 uh, and just be the original 22 pages and then number two be $4. And they would have sold probably double mm -hmm. the amount that they did. But, you know, we live and learn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, these books are both being um, sold as floppies, but you also have, um, they're also available in Comixology? They're all available digitally in Comixology, mm -hmm. yeah. What was your experience? Is this the first time you've worked with Comixology, or had you done it in the past? Well, they pick up most of my stuff and put it on, put it in, is, have make it available digitally. Um, the guy who, one of the guys that runs Comixology, Chip Mosher, mm -hmm. I've known him since the night, since 1990. Oh, okay. Uh, and you know, and we're we're pretty close. And I I, you know, only had just rejected Heroines, and I'm like, what do you think of just going straight digital? He's like. You know, no, no, really? take it to Image, take it to somebody before you take it to us, because we can't do what for you what you need this book to do. Mm -hmm. so, uh, like so he's a good guy, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not to toot Comixology's horn, but they're not, they're not terrible people. Mm -hmm. But then again, they're also, it's very aware from what he said that you can't really launch big from Comixology. It's, mm -hmm. It is a frustrating thing for me mm -hmm. that we still have to publish floppies. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have just done that book as for as a bunch of comicsology titles for super cheap and then put out a trade. Mm -hmm. But not enough people buy uh, digital comics. Uh -huh. um, and I think that you know I think that there's a lot of factors for that, but I don't know the solution. Do you find that um, that you like get that you get a bunch of new readers when you publish trades? Like yes. Yes. Well, trades are easy to stock and restock. Mm -hmm. uh, floppies don't tend to stay on the shelves for very long. Right. You know, because of the nature of the market, there's only so much shelf space for floppies. Trades, you just you put in the wall, you put the spine out, and it just stays there for as long as they need to sell it. Mm -hmm. And so people are not afraid to, to order trades, and they're not afraid to like reorder trades once they're you know, their stock is sold through. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you walk, walk into, these days, you walk into any comic book shop or m in most bookshops and you'll see a copy of Courtney Cormoran sitting on the shelf. Because mm -hmm. uh, at least, you know, if they're cool. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, and that's, that's really nice, you know, like that's a perennial seller. I wrote it in 2002 and now, and it's still going strong. Mm -hmm. 15 years later. <laughs> Do you prefer working in this like in the serial in this like serial format of floppies? Because I noticed a lot of your books are in um, like floppies to like trades. Honestly, no. I actually would prefer to just go straight to trade, but um, 
but that doesn't that's not how the, the business it's easier to make for the publisher to make their money back by selling floppies mm -hmm. somehow there's more money to be made and then producing the floppies putting them out there getting them getting them into stores drums up awareness of the book mm -hmm. and then even if people don't buy that that those floppies they buy the trade i actually put a twitter out a twitter message out to the world like you do uh, the other day asking if people like bought floppies or waited for the trade and the vast majority said they waited for the trade you know yeah, it's still I a lot of people wait for the trade. yeah you wait for the trade <laughs> you know i mean who who has room in their house for boxes you know cardboard boxes full of comic books was um Some of us. you're awesome <laughs> <laughs> i could tell you were awesome right away because you were just like you know like everybody sat down and he's doing his notes and just yeah, <laughs> You're the, yeah, there you go. That's what we all should be doing. Mm -hmm. I should mm -hmm. be sketching right now. Same, <laughs> yeah. So do you, when you're writing um, arcs for these like serial um, projects, do you, like, do you have an idea in mind about how long um, Heroines is going to be or how long Knight's Dominion is going to be? Um, is it I all scripted already? N well, I mean, the first six issues were hard scripted mm -hmm. like the first story arc was hard scripted and then everything after that is just ideas mm -hmm. uh then i went and i hard scripted the second act the whole like the next book is going to be eight issues long and i should have made the first one eight issues long too everybody complained the only complaint is that it's too rushed it's too cramped because mm -hmm. um, i i had this idea that you know m you compress more information into less pages and it gets better but you know sometimes you need to let the stories breathe a little bit mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah book two is going to be eight issues that's all planned out i have ideas for like three more arcs at least and like i have an ending an end point at some point um but uh but like with heroines i have the first arc i have some ideas for the second arc that's mm -hmm. it you know and same with that but that's kind of got got me in trouble with uh, Princess Ugg. I was, I was sure that I was gonna keep going and with Princess Ugg, but I got to the end of issue eight and I'm like, I got no, no stories in the hopper for this. Mm -hmm. I kind of didn't love Princess Ugg once I was drawing it as much as I loved writing it. I wrote it and I cried my eyes out how much I loved that damn thing. But, but then I got to drawing it and I was just like, yeah, this isn't, I've, I had, I was, it had been five years since I'd written it. I had moved on mm -hmm. creatively. I was kind of in a different space. And I just didn't feel like coming up with more of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but because I'm, you know, writing and drawing my own stuff, self -pub or publishing independently through a company that doesn't retain ownership, I don't have to worry about it. I just, you know, okay, well, that was that, you know, mm -hmm. book finished, looks good, I'm happy, it's a package. Yeah, so do you just get to be, like, do you determine when when you're done with something on all of your projects these days? Well, they're not going to strong arm me or sue me if I don't keep going on Princess Ugg. So right. that's nice. Yeah. Um, you know, with Courtney, with the last two Courtney books, you know, my publisher kind of said we kind of want you to do the next Courtney series before we do Princess Ugg. Mm -hmm. um, and those ended up being the two best Courtney books, like the last two are the two best ones. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, I mean, they're all good, but the last two are definitely, I think, are definitely the best. And I don't know where that came from. But I think it's just something about ending that's really, like, really creating, like, I had been working on the, the series and the characters for years, and they'd been in the back of my brain. And, and I came up with this point of I wanted to write a definitive ending for this story, and I really got to revitalize the story by thinking okay what you know what is the story about yeah. what is like you know now that i've established the characters and i put them in their little world and each each book had its own each volume stands alone and is its own story but if i'm putting a real definitive ending on this story how does how must it end mm -hmm. uh, and that really got me excited to really create closure and make a statement about about or at least ask the big question, that's kind of what storytelling is, is mm -hmm. you're asking a big question and hopefully answering it, mm -hmm. you know, maybe answering it with a question or, you know, but like, will this, you know, will this grumpy, angry, hostile, lonely little kid connect with someone? And, you know, the answer is the end of the book. Dang. <laughs> um, so, is there any advice that you would give to a younger Ted just making a start in comics that our students like could particularly learn from? Like a 
things you wish that you could particularly slap. Get a time machine. Uh, go to the future. Get something awesome that <laughs> definitely hit big and go back and do that. So like the big, like, <laughs> like just steal like, you know, Mad Max Fury Road and just do that 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier. You know, ruining it for everybody, basically. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't know. I, I, if I could tell, if I could say to myself what I would do, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm mm -hmm. still like, you know, like, cause I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm really stuck. Like, it seems to be that, you know, my by far my most successful thing was Courtney Crumrin. It's still hugely perennial seller, and it may be because it's existed for so long. It has seven volumes, and people fell in love with it. Now, on the other hand, if I try to explain what Courtney Crumrin is, it is not like the most, it doesn't have a hot little log line. It doesn't have a hook. Hmm. You know, I, I try to explain it to you and you're like, eh, okay, whatever. But then people read it and they're like, this is awesome. It's a great book, guys. Um, <laughs> and then I have Princess Ugg, which does have a great hook. It's about a barbarian princess going to princess finishing school. And people read it and they're like, yeah, this is good. You know, this is awesome. This is okay. But it's not the same, you know. Mm -hmm. But it could be just that I should have done five volumes of Princess Ugg instead of just the one. Mm, yeah. Or there's just like something that really, like something ethereal that really resonates. About Courtney? Yeah. That's, and I'm starting to wonder about that. So, and there's, I'll never know. I'll never know why Courtney did better than, you know, Polly and the Pirates or Princess Ugg. I mean, the only, ob the obvious thing is that there's more of Courtney. Uh, and that gives people more of a chance. But, I, but that's not the answer for me because I don't want to be tied down to doing the same thing for the rest of my career. You know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not Stan Sakai. I don't want to do Usagi Yojimbo for, you know, for the rest of my life. You know, I just, I, I love rabbits and I love samurai, but that, I can't, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's been doing that book since I was a kid. Like, that's crazy. Uh, and he's still putting along, going strong. Mm -hmm. but, and, and that book has a huge following. But I'm not going to do that. I, mm -hmm. I need to change. I, for one thing, I got sick of drawing. I got sick of drawing princesses, for one thing. <laughs> sick to, I mean, you can see, like, I, drawing this guy and that bird was so much fun. Then I get to drawing her, and I'm, oh, I already hate you, lady. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. Well, we have some images in this slideshow that show um, your drawing process. Mm. Um, could you walk us through um, that process a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you want to take, okay, take us there. So, like, great example of a cover I did. Sorry, let me speak into the microphone. <laughs> uh, this is a cover. I just, I knocked out this sketch. It's like, it was the only sketch I did, unusually, usually, like, you know, I draw a sketch, and I'm like, yeah, it's good enough, and then I hate myself, and then I draw another one, and then, yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit better, and then, I, and then I get frustrated, and my ability to draw goes away, and then, like, two more sketches that just suck, and then, like, somehow there's some blood and some crying and some snot, and, <laughs> and uh, like, maybe four sketches appear, and some of them are good, and then I, I show them to my publisher, my publisher picks the one I like the least, and says, this one. <laughs> Um, well, I hate that process, so I just did, I did this one sketch and it felt just so right and so simple. And I really like this, I feel like with covers, you know, my, like the, cov the trade cover of this series, Knights of Dominion, is way too busy. I hate it. Um, it's great, but I hate it. Uh, and this is so elegantly simple and I just, so I'm like, I'm going to just, I'm just going to go straight to inks from this. So I inked it and that's what I came up with. Um, and it, yeah, it works. It's, it's so, and I, I added the, you know, I added that floor pattern, which looks kind of awesome. I made that digitally and then hand drew and then uh, hand traced it with a quill so that it looks like actual ink line, but it was originally done digitally so that the math was right. Because I, I, I got into this so I didn't have to do math. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and then I threw on some color and it comes to life. With Knight's Dominion, the color really makes a huge difference. Very, it really contributes to the mood of the, of the whole illustration. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the paintiness is really fun. I like, I cho chose this. I mean, I'm just using like a basic Photoshop with a basic paint, paint brush that's really fast. 
It's not complicated. It doesn't have like, you don't see a little figure of the brush and the tilt or any of that shit. <laughs> None of that. This is just, it's just real quick and dirty, but it gets a nice texture that I really like, that I, I feel like works. And it's super fast to produce. Uh, and that's that. And then uh, there's, I think there's a couple, there's one, f or a couple of them for, um, see, Knight's Dominion, awesome color. Uh, yeah. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and then if you, there's a, a couple of process ones for heroines as well. Oh, here we go. I use Quill for, I use uh, Hunt 102s for Knight's Dominion because I like the flexible line, although I have been known to go to the 107s, which are a little stiffer. Um, those tend to be the typical map making pens that everybody uses for drawing comic books. Um, with, uh, uh, with heroines, I've been using markers because I really want to make it feel like animation. You can see that these lines are, you know, there's not a lot of variety in the lines. They have an almost mechanical quality that I was going for. Um, and that's kind of part of the fun of the book. And then let's, let's throw the color on and then in, I color it in this kind of cell animation style. So it looks like a high-end animated movie, but it doesn't look, it doesn't have the massive gradations or like little points of light that get overused in comic books. Mm -hmm. You know, I really like that simple flat color and just, you know, there's some, there's some gradients in there, but I keep them to a minimum. I don't, I try not to let them distract. Like you can see like, there's a little bit of gradient on Thunder Girl's breast there and that's, that's it. Like that's as fancy as I get. Uh, the rest, I really want to keep it real flat, real simple. Uh, there's a lot of panels that I do in heroines where, like, you know, I, like I put a flat color on a face, and it's like, it's just quite not quite enough. I want to hit some highlights. What color should the highlights be? And I'm, screw it. It's just going to be white. Just white highlights. Just keep it so simple. I, want, I even want the color schemes to be pretty simple. Even as it is, I would like, I think I want to get simpler than this. I almost wish that I had done her back with white highlights instead of, you know, flesh tone. Just stuff like that. Like, I just want to keep it really stark and, and minimal and uh, like it's... Because, I, you know, like I came up with the idea when I was watching, you know, Justice League cartoons, which are super crude and super minimal. And then here's the process again. Oh, this one's fun because, see the top corner there? I hate that. <laughs> I hate that pose so much. It's just like... It, I thought it would work, and then it just got worse, and then the coloring, and I replaced it in the coloring. Yeah, see, now it's awesome. That's a page, and I just sketched that out, and I'm like, that's what I wanted to do. You know, it's much simpler. You could put that on a t-shirt, be totally badass. You know, that's what I wanted. Awesome. Let's uh, go ahead and open up the, open up for questions. Yeah. <laughs> 